Good morning, and thank you for joining us for worship online today. We're so glad that you're here. We're back worshiping in person this week after a brief respite because of weather last Sunday. We're thankful that you were able to join us both for that service and for this one. Next week, we have the Watoto children coming in a virtual concert. This is a concert you can watch from your home or you can join us in person to watch it on our screens in the worship center. Either way, that information will be announced in our email this coming week. Thanks again for joining us. We're gonna join in the worship live on stage. watching online. Thank you so much for watching today. Uh, we Again, we want to make a connection with you. If you've got a prayer request or something, maybe a question about our church, right now you can see the email address or the phone number. You just pick up the phone right now or email us and we will be in contact with you this week. So you guys ready to sing today? You ready to praise? Let's have everyone stand to our feet and I'll tell you something. I've got a testimony I want to share with you today that I was in death and now I am in life and it's all because of Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christ follower today, you've got a testimony. We want to sing that out and shout it because that's the good news. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Amen I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Yes I do Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven yes my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Come together, sons and daughters. Come on, sing it with us now. Here we go. Come together, sons and daughters. Fall in the blood and wash through the water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God. We'll finish what he started. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. From death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Aren't you thankful for Jesus Christ today that he brings us into life from death? into the light from darkness. Come on, God, we know you can finish what you started in us. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. Sing it, church. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous 
I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Whoa. Come on, church. Let's lift a praise offering to the Lord today. Amen. We've got a testimony to celebrate. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies And I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief And I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody and I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me and I'm gonna sing up this morning church come on and I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah and I will watch the darkness leave I raise a hallelujah Stop. 
be seated for just a moment. battle for the lives of the unborn goes on, and in a world that has such a disregard for life, and especially life that comes before presence into the, into the world, it's, uh, it's really worthy of our thoughts today and our prayers uh, on this, uh, this Sunday, this Sanctity of Life Sunday. So please remember that Grace House. Uh, an exciting work. We have a, a staff member that's on board. That's right, Libby Hutchinson. Libby that's Hutchinson right. is now on the uh, Grace House board. Right. They're looking at some real strong plans for the coming year to do more uh, to assist these women who've made a determination to, to carry a child when others around them would say, don't let your life be interrupted. So uh, really, really special uh, that, that we remember that on this Sunday. Uh, the radio broadcast today that's going out is from Francis Maddox and Michelle Scoggins, and that's in memory of their father, Jim, uh, their father and papa, and uh, we want to certainly thank them for that. They paid for several weeks that uh, we're going to be able to cover to make sure this radio bro broadcast gets out to a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we're kind of amazed. I'll, I'll see people all over town, and then they'll say, hey, we listen every week, and right. thanks for doing that. Uh, we have a prayer quilt today. Christy Nichols is uh, Lynn Nichols' wife. You know she's fighting brain cancer. And her prayer is for healing, wisdom for the doctors, and peace for her family as she goes through this treatment for cancer. Many of you that know uh, Christy know she's a fighter. Uh, she's fought cancer before. And she has, it, yeah, and, and, and come out victorious. She so has. She's so expecting... she, she has no other idea but yeah. that you just do it and you win. And that's the faith she's going into this with. You can tie a knot, a knot in that prayer quilt right out there. Uh, there's hand sanitizer there. You've got a little space. So you can do that. And she'll have that for her uh, to cover her as she goes through all of the chemo and other things that are going on. Buddy, it's been a tough week. It has. Uh, a pretty, pretty tough week. Another tough week. Really. An another tough week. I've uh, got eight deaths that uh, we report this week in our church family. One was Jewel Phelan. Now, Jewel, she was a member here. Guess how long? I'm going to guess more than 60 years. 61 years. Wow. 61 years, a member at Northside Baptist Church. So that means you were only 50 when oh, she joined. Oh, let's not, let's let this move right it's along. Right. Mark Nelson was privileged to do the funeral service for his grandmother a week or so ago. Yeah. and. We certainly want to remember them. That you, you know, you've done funeral for family members, I have. Uh, and it's it's quite an experience because you're talking to your own family, and yeah. and all those memories are coming up while you're talking. Yeah. And yeah, it's a privilege, but it's it's tough. It is, yeah. You know, some some of them may know the person better even than you did, right? And when you're in your family unit like that, yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. Bill Beavers passed away, uh, COVID death, and, uh, and this is the husband of Alice and the father of Joni May. Leo Edwards as well, the father of Linda Turney, fought cancer, and uh, that service was held this week. David Slimp, the brother of Julie Gowen, passed away. 
Kathy Collier lost her mother, uh, and she's another trapped in the COVID situation. She has COVID, mm -hmm. so they can't have the service, right. and so things are interrupted there. And then Laura Carlisle and Allie, uh, Laura's father, Carl Jansen, passed away. Allie's the granddaughter. This is also uncle of Billy Groves, and those services are pending right now. But after a long battle against COVID, he succumbed. And then Jean Kaysen, uh, nine months after losing her husband, lost her son uh, this week. That's the brother of Billy Nichols and Karen Edwards. Uh, so David, David Nichols, that service is gonna be pending as well. All of these different names ring in my heart with stories of the past. Yeah. Uh, when you've been pastor over 20 years, you kind of walk through something with nearly every family at some point or another. And my heart breaks for these that are having to go through all of this. Now, saying all of that, I witnessed a miracle last night. Uh, we had a member who really was just saved. His life was spared. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are so grateful for that. And he is recovering right now. Yep. Very critical care over in Plano. But uh, I watch God just lay it all together, put it all together. Uh, the helicopter being on, the doctors being on call, everything was there for the saving of his just life. A, and, and just a little bit of, of time one way or the other. And, and Would not have taken hardly anything at all for him yeah. to have lost his yeah. life. Yeah. And so we see those as well. Yeah. Now you've got some exciting things to tell us about yeah. Uh, yeah. what's going on. Why don't we pray first and then we'll do the... You want the, to do uh, that? Yeah. yeah Go let's ahead. Let's pray. Father, there's so many things to, uh, to lay before you. And uh, God, it's, it's been a season of that. More than, more than one week, we've had four or five or six or seven people from our congregation that, that have lost someone. And, uh, and Lord, as we struggle under the weight of that, help us to be reminded to, to raise that hallelujah. Yes. God, that, that, that our loss is temporal and that they are eternity and, and eternally with you. Mm. Father, as we think about the, the, the sanctity of life and we think about how we as individuals can, can support that and can, can be warriors for life, God, I pray that you'll impress upon us all the ways in which around us that sometimes life is devalued oh, okay. through systems and through through things that we don't have much control over but God re remind us that you're sovereign and that we can call upon the one who does have control so Lord we love you we praise you and we thank you for this day it's in Jesus name we pray amen somebody didn't turn their phone off yeah somebody somebody's old spice so, so on top of that, let me give you some really, really good news, aside from Mr. Old Spice standing next to me here. Um, we, we do have a, a business conference today that we need to, to take care of. Typically, we would do this in a quarterly conference, but it's, it's a weird year and nothing's gone right. So Jeff Geyer offered up a motion this morning before service to start us into business conference, and Johnny Garam seconded that. So we're going to go into business conference for two minutes. You have in your bulletin some notes on our budget for next year. Um, the good news is, or also in your bulletin, is the note on how our final offering came in last year. We, wrote, we, we brought in $129,000 more than we needed for budget. And yeah, uh, that was incredible. after spending 48 weeks behind budget. So God yeah. really came through for us in the end and through you. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, next Lord. year's budget, if you want a copy of it, is in guest services. You should have gotten a ballot when you came in. If you didn't, you can pick one up after service. We're gonna turn those in in the offering as you leave, all right? So this is very low key. If you didn't get a ballot, step outside after service, grab one, you can vote your preference, give it to one of our guest services team or one of the ushers and we'll take care of it. Right. But we're presenting a budget that is 6.5% lower than what we presented for you last year and 9.5% lower than what we actually brought in last year. Typically, we budget 2% more than the previous year's receipts 
This year we're going the opposite direction. And, and the reasons for that are obvious. We're still not out of this pandemic. Right. We don't know how the economy is going right. to recover. We have great hope that all that's going to be fine, and it may be. And if it is, then we're going to be in better shape next year than we were last year. But if things continue to struggle, we're prepared for that financially. And right. so um, that's the budget you have in front of you. The, the, the outline that is in the bulletin. None of our ministries were affected. Uh, they're all funded at previous year's level. All of our mission relationships are intact at the previous year's level. Uh, we just trimmed unnecessary items, things we weren't using as much of. It's amazing how much you don't spend on copies when you're not printing a bulletin for four months, right? It's so, it, it saved us a ton in that regard. So those are the things that are in that budget. Yeah, and so the, the, the bottom line is if you give faithfully, you can save Jim's job. If you give faithfully, you can save Van's job. <laughs> I was getting ready to say, aren't you thankful for our pastor and executive pastor? And we are, we're thankful for their leadership and church. I'll tell you what, as we enter into this new week, continue this new year, no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what the world says that we are, let me just r remind all of us and through this song, we are children of God. So let's stand and declare that today with our voices and worship him as a child of God. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love.
Amen. You may be seated. tell you how good I feel today. I feel amazing. Glad to be back here today. 1928, President Herbert Hoover coined a phrase, rugged individualism. He saw the Great Depression coming and trying to get ahead of it. He told every person in America, you should be able to help yourself out and the government does not need to get involved in your economic affairs. That's what rugged individualism was about. Well, the West began to progress into an individualism, but it wasn't Herbert Hoover's philosophy. The individualism the West, America, began to move into was the pursuit of self-gratification. It became about what I want. My individualism is me, 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 and more of me. I want what I want, and I want it now, right? So, this search for self-gratification began to be, I'll step on anybody and anything to get what I want. It's family, organizations, my own community, it doesn't matter, I want what I want. And you can see this through the centuries, through the ages, through the, uh, the decades at least, in the 60s, the goal was find yourself. People did, they didn't like what they found. In the, in the 70s, it was improve yourself. And this is when self-help courses began, health spas began to abound, and people were still wholly unsatisfied with life. In the 80s, they said, oh, just serve yourself. We had the big economic boom, and materialism began to just fly off the charts, and people had everything they wanted, but they were still unfulfilled in life. Well, in the 90s, the goal was to express yourself. If you're over 40, you get that. But people did express themselves, and the message was very unclear. It was very jumbled. And in the new millennia, it was be yourself. But you know what we found out? We found out we're rude, abrasive, condescending, and entitled. Nobody wanted that. So everybody was looking for something. People are still looking for something to satisfy that individualism within themselves. And the answer, in my opinion, the answer to this destructive, destructive overemphasis our culture has placed on individual gratification always has been, always will be the gospel of Jesus Christ. It asks us to lay down our lives, to lay down our dreams and our desires, to lose our life, to find it in Christ Jesus. You see, the means by which the gospel works is through the celebration of gathering together that we call family. We, we, we call it church, but it's family. That's what it is. And, and what that is is accountability and ability to be better together than we could ever be on our own. The phrase that I've always said is we are better than I could ever be. Together we are something. As individuals seeking our own paths, that can be dangerous. But together, if we're unified and move forward in in the same way for the same thing, the gospel is unstoppable. Amen? Amen? So this is what I want you to see. First and foremost, God relates to his creation in the context of a family setting. God loves the idea of family. And in fact, it is bred into all of creation. Even when the trees and the vegetation were made, it was them and their kind. When the animals were made, it was these animals and their kind, human beings and their kind. God loves the idea of family. He categorized all of creation into family. When God wanted to begin a nation, he started with a man named Abraham. And according to Genesis chapter 12, the purpose was that through this man, all of the families on earth would be blessed. So family's a big deal with God. And More than that, God chose to reveal himself as the father of a family. 
Think about this. In the English, it doesn't, it doesn't hit as hard as it does in the Greek because the Greek word for father is pater. The Greek word for family is patria. It's the same word. One is singular, one is plural. So God is saying, this family, this is mine. This is me. And so when you look at God, he, he wanted us to know him as a father. He could have said, I want you to call me supreme creator. I want you to call me the, the uh, almighty. And he is all of these things and all of those fit. And we're justified in calling him that. But more than that, he asked us to call on him as father because he is the father of the family. Well, if he's the father, who's the family? God's family on earth is the church. That's me and you. God is the father, we're the family. And the, God's family on earth is the church and it's important for us to, to know that and to understand that as believers that our giftings, our uh, purpose, all of this is developed and realized as we gather together as family. Uh, specifically in your local church. And when we embrace this truth and cooperate with God's delegated leaders and community, we're placed in and we thrive and we come alive. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm just asking this question. You found purpose, you found fulfillment when you started getting involved in your local church you began to realize what God had called you to do, who he'd called you to be when you got involved in your local church. You began to see family when you got involved in a local church. You began to have people checking on you and caring for you like never before when you got involved in your local church. Because this is the family of God. How did it all start? It was the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the church was gathered in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to do so. And tongues of fire appeared over their head and they began to uh, speak in other tongues and everybody was seeing this happen. They were wondering what was going on and a guy by the name of Peter, a disciple of Jesus, stepped up and began to preach a message. He preached a message that told them this is a fulfillment of prophecy. He says, Jesus is both Lord and Christ. And he began to preach the gospel to them and they were cut to the heart and they said, what do we need to do? Peter says, you need to be baptized. Have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And do you know how many people stepped up and said yes to that? 3,000 souls that day. 3,000 people added to the church, an influx of 3,000 believers. Many who did not live there, they were just there for the festival. So other believers who lived there started giving what they had to take care of one another as a family. And they began to talk to one another and they began to help one another. Now, what was the message? The message of the church always has been, always will be the gospel. We are sinners and we are hopelessly separated from God because of our sin. But God, because of his Love sent his son Jesus to die a death on a cross that would pay the price for my sin and for your sin. The good news is that because God's grace is towards us, he allows us to have faith. He allows us to repent of that sin and be brought into his family and have eternal life with him. That's the message of the church. So that what's the mission of the church then? Well, the mission of the church is the great commission. Go make disciples, baptize them, teach them. That was the idea. Paul the apostle would tell the church in Ephesus, hey, your job is to equip the saints for the work of that ministry. So this family has this goal of preaching the gospel and making disciples. And that's what the early church was all about. And you say, well, man, that was easy for them. No, it wasn't. You see, this world we live in can seem messed up to us but you don't know how messed up first century was. For a believer in Christ, that meant least of all ridicule, persecution, even death. But people were still drawn to the church. They still wanted to be a part of it. Even though there was the persecution and possible death, people still wanted to come, why? Well, 
the, the simple answer is that God wooed them to come, but what was the means that God used? Second point, people wanted to be part of the church because it had all the elements of a family and it impacted each individual eternally. You see, people were getting from these other believers what they weren't getting before they knew that Christ was Messiah. They weren't getting that. You see, from this point forward, from Pentecost forward, the church never died out. It always continued to go on. What was their secret? How did they make disciples? How did they uh, uh, equip the saints for the work of the ministry? How did, we, how did they do it? Well, they had four values that they stood upon. Let's turn to the book of Acts chapter two and look at those values. Acts chapter two, verse 42. The Bible says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. Listen, the early church had these four values that they stood upon. Four values that they really pushed in unity towards. And the first one was the apostles' teaching. You see, they were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. That means they were devoted to the things that the apostles were teaching them from the word of God. They were devoted to it. Now, for many of us, Bible reading is not a devotion, although we may call it that. It is maybe something that we check off the list that we think we should do every morning as a believer. But how many of us are truly wholeheartedly devoted to the word of God and to the teaching that comes about the word of God? The number one earmark of a biblical model of a church is that they studied the word of God. And if Northside Baptist Church is going to be the growing, healthy church, then the word of God must be first and foremost. It has to be. The word of God must take priority in our lives and in our church and not just be an add-on and not just be a caveat that we use to make our own individual point. We need to be people who are about his word, about God's word and doing what he wants us to do, not using it to manipulate our maneuvers to say, look, aren't we biblical? No, we wanna be about what God wants us to be about. So my goal in this point is not to convince you about a book. <laughs> I want to invite you into the very heart of God for that is what the word of God is. It is a revelation of God. You guys like superhero movies? Nobody likes superhero movies. I love a superhero movie. I remember when I was 10 years old, I would walk down to the Superstop. I would buy a pack of now laters and a Marvel comic book. That makes my memory water right there. That's good stuff. Good days. Well, they really started making superhero movies well in the last 10 years. You see, before that, it was, it was the 1960s Batman with the shark spray. You may not remember that, but I do. They started making them well. And, and, and what happened is Marvel Comics teamed up with his movie uh, producers and they started doing the, what's called the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And over the last 10 years, they've made 21 movies. And it ended with a movie called Endgame, right? That movie made $2.8 billion in the theater. Now, I use that as a crude transition to my point here. The Bible itself was written by 40 authors inspired by the Holy Spirit, penned on three different continents over the course of 2,000 years, and it has one subject matter. And I love you enough to tell you that it's not me or you. The subject matter of the Bible is God himself. How God is redeeming and bringing mankind back to himself because of man's own sin. That is the subject matter of the Bible. So when we get into the word of God, know that it's not a book of good advice. It is not a self-help book. It's not a road map to life. It's not basic instructions before leaving earth. I know that's fun to say. But the Bible is a self-revelation of God himself. So when I open these words, it is not a book. If you're looking at this as a book with stories and self-help and self-guidance, you've missed the point. 
This book is about God himself and how he wants to work in your life. The Bible answers all the questions that lie at the heart of every human being. Now, you say, well, the Bible doesn't tell me what I should wear this morning. Put on clothes, jackrabbit. <laughs> so, <laughs> the real questions of life. What, what is real truth? What is ultimate? Where do we come from? What is the matter with people? You ever ask that question? Read the news, right? Watch the TV. What is wrong with people? Well, the Bible tells us this. Is there hope for us? That's found in the word of God as well. You see, and, and how do we get these answers? Where, where should we go to hear this kind of news? We go to the word of God, but let me tell you what God has done. He has ordained preaching and teaching in the church as a primary conduit for the message of his word, not my opinion, not my pet peeves, not my doubts. The word of God taught by pastors and teachers to you is how God has set it up. In fact, Paul the apostle said, God has ordained the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Truthfully, <laughs> I think about it. Why does anybody want to hear what I have to say? You know what I mean? I, I, I grew up a stone's throw from Chunky, Mississippi. Nobody wants to hear what this boy's got to say. But I realize it's not me. It's God's word. I'm just, a, I'm just a tool that God is using. Do you understand? There's nothing about me that makes anything more special than another. This is the word of God that makes it special. That's why the old saying goes, if there is a mist in the pulpit, there will be a fog in the pew. As pastors, teachers in this church, we need to be very sure that we're teaching biblical messages to you guys because you are put under our care spiritually and we need to make sure we're doing our job. The early church had this hunger and desire to meet, hear the word of God at any cost. Secondly, the early church was devoted to fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia and it can mean communion, partnership, or generosity. It's not simply just socializing together. It's doing things together for the purpose of the kingdom of God. This is fellowship. It's not two fellows in the same ship. It's more than that. <laughs> and do you know that it goes hand in hand, fellowship with God and fellowship with people? Jesus says, the greatest commandment is to love God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul. The second, that is just like the first, is to love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, if you want to make sure that you are having great fellowship with people, you need to be having great fellowship with God. And if you wanna make sure you're having great fellowship with God, take a look at how you're treating other people. You see, the problem is, is we have this TV dinner mentality when it comes to how we relate things, right? We compartmentalize. I got my Salisbury steak right here. I've got mashed potatoes, peas, cherry cobbler on the side. I can keep it all separated. And we do this in our lives as well. We'll go to church and we'll raise our hands higher than anybody and then go to work on Monday and then we'll be the biggest liars, gossips, backbiters that the world has ever seen. Come back to church the next Sunday and not even worry about how we treated people all week long. So God says, I don't want you to have this TV dinner mentality. God wants us to be chicken pot pie. Just mix it all together, right? How you're treating people and how you're treating, how your relationship is with God is, is all inextricably linked. Watch how you're treating other people. This is a mirror image of your relationship with the Lord. That's why fellowship was a big deal to the early church. It meant a lot because they were loving one another. And what that was was an overflow of their love for God coming out to other people. Third, the early church was devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, this expression, breaking of bread, is used in the New Testament to talk about the Lord's Supper, and it's also to talk about a meal. 
In this context, I think they're talking about the Lord's Supper because why would they tell us they were devoted to eating their meals? They were very nutritious in the first century. That wasn't the idea. The idea is that they were getting together as a practice of the early church to have communion together. And they would do it on the first day of the week, on Sunday. And then they would have a feast that would follow that. They called it a love feast. And when they would take this communion, the idea in their minds should be the same in our minds is what Jesus did when he instituted this. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So the Lord's Supper is much more than a little cracker and a cup of grape juice. It's not something that we do out of obligation or tradition. It shouldn't be. It should be when we eat the bread and we drink the juice that we are partaking in the Lord's table of faith. Realizing and saying, Lord, I believe that you died in my place for my sin, that you shed your blood to pay that price that brought me into your family. You've washed me clean. You've made me whole. You've taken the punishment that should have been mine upon your own body. That's what they would do when they would break bread together. When I take communion, when you take communion, what are you thinking about? Service is almost done. I wonder if I can get every ounce of juice out of that cup. Why does this bread taste so stale? Come on, somebody. Our minds need to be focused on what this means, not what it is. Fourth, early church was devoted to prayer. Corporate prayer was a major emphasis in the early church. The disciples understood that praying together was power. From the day of Pentecost on, they met regularly for the purpose of prayer. Now, if New Testament Christians saw the importance of praying together, I think we need to understand that there's an importance in prayer, right? We need to know this. And most would agree that, that it's a good thing for Christians to do is to pray together, but we have to move beyond this intellectual ascent and take specific action steps, providing teaching on prayer, providing prayer in our classroom settings. I know I talked to Scott Holly not long ago. He's gonna start a Wednesday night prayer group where you just meet and you pray. He said, well, how do you do that? I think we all have a lot to talk to God about. <laughs> Look, it's clear if you read through the book of Acts, prayer was not a show. When they would meet together, they didn't just open their meetings with a word of prayer. Their meeting was prayer. And do you know because of those meetings that you and I have heard the gospel today? Because it was in a prayer meeting that the Holy Spirit called Paul and Silas to step out and to be sent on a mission to take the gospel in, into uh, Europe. And it spread from there over here. And because you and I have heard the gospel today is because of a prayer meeting back in the first century. We need to be people of prayer. What is that gonna do for us? How, what, what will that, how will we know if we're doing these things? And I don't want you to look at this as being, oh, I, I, I've been doing this and I've been doing that and you're checking down your list. Don't think of it like that. I want you to think of this, is this part of who I am? Because that was the case for the early church. It was just part of who they were. They weren't waking up checking a list. It was the values that they held in their heart. And because of those values, there were some results that came. There were results of a properly functioning church family. If you look at verse 43, we see the beginning of this. It says that all fell on everyone. All came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. This is reverence. You know, everybody talks about the church being relevant today. And I'm with that. We, we should be able to, to uh, relate to people on a relevant, uh, uh, that it, in a way that's relevant. But that can't take the place of reverence because in my opinion, it's much more important to be biblical than it is to be cool. Somebody at least nod on that one? Yes. 
Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. That's unity. The strength of a church family is found in its ability to be unified together. And that only happens when we discover what's important overall and we make our way towards that one thing, which should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. That should be important to us. We should be able to unify in that. And the grand thing is when we unify as a church body, individually we begin to find our niche and how we're supposed to do that for God. It's amazing how that works out. Verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the, pro, to the proceeds to all as any had need. This is generosity. A lot of people read this and they say, that's socialism. No, this was voluntary. This was not forced. They were giving to people as they had need because they were generous, because the love of God was in their heart. They had an eagerness to help other people. And you know, generosity is not solely about wealth. It also includes this sincerity towards the circumstances of other people. There's some things and problems that I have and you have in life that money won't solve. You know that? And so it's more than just wealth. It's being sincere towards your situation. Verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. That's presence. As believers, we need to be present with one another. Like th this is, this is the, the, the good and the bad of, of what's happened around us. The good thing is that people are able to watch online, right, as well as come to our worship center. This is the problem, though, is that sometimes watching online, the convenience of that keeps people isolated away from other people. So I'm not saying that everybody needs to bum rush to church. What I'm saying is that do not become isolated where you are. Find other believers to fellowship with. Find other believers to have community with. Even if it's in your homes, find that, right? We need that. We need to be present with one another. We don't need to isolate ourselves away. Verse 47, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. That's increase. God's prescription for church growth. If we're intentional to take care of the depth of our ministry, God will take care of the breadth of our ministry. If we will be intentional about how deep we're taking people into the knowledge of our Savior, God will make sure that he takes care of how wide it wants to go. Otherwise, we end up a mile long and an inch deep. The goal of the church should not be to get big, but to be strong. Now, last thing I gotta say. The way that we read scripture tells us, or, or should I say it does not suggest that the early church acted like family. They were family. It wasn't an act. They were doing what was natural because of who they were. What makes the church unique is that it's the only establishment that Jesus Christ ever started and it is never going to quit. Amen. It is eternal. Whether you like it or don't like it, you're stuck with me for eternity if you know Jesus. <laughs> We're family. You're not getting rid of it. <laughs> the church transcends race. It transcends nationality. It transcends gender. And the church does not need to be reinvented. The church needs to be rediscovered. And it needs to function in the way that the Bible tells us that it functioned. Because if we will do that, if we will be that, oh, we won't have to worry. If the churches in Parker County would be 
the biblical model of church, we would not have enough seats in the pews and in the, in the buildings and the churches that we have. And we have 20 dozen or more churches, right? I almost said 411. We got 411 churches in Parker County. And if we would be the church that we're supposed to be, we won't have seats enough to fill it in when the gospel of Jesus Christ turns our county, our state, our nation, this world upside down again. Amen. Amen. I'm praying for it. I'm praying for it. I believe it. To function as a family in simplicity. Let's do it, church. What do you say? Let's stand. As Brad and the praise team come, they're gonna sing, they're gonna play a song. These altars will be open for you. If you need to come down here and pray, you come and pray. If you need someone to pray with you, just motion for me, I'll come down and pray with you. More than anything, if, if the word of God has touched your heart today that maybe, man, I, I need to make sure that I'm making these my values. Please do not hesitate to talk to the Lord about that today because we need to be the church, not just act like it. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for how you've established everything and made us your family here on earth, a representative of the Father. God, help us to, to be those that take on the mission of spreading the, the gospel message, making disciples. Lord, and not just something that we do, let it flow from who we are, God so that this world can know you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You come as the Lord leads you. Let's build our life upon the values that Sam has preached about. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you To sing his name, Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around Jesus, the name above every other name Yes, he's worthy Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me Father, we pray over this church today That you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and That we would build our life upon you, Lord And let it be a firm foundation And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. 
and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I. Today, just give him a praise offering. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Hey, Northside. My name is Jason Talent here in Boston, Massachusetts. We have planted a church, uh, Harbor City Church, and uh, this year has been <laughs> incredibly strange. And I know that you guys are experiencing really the same thing that we have experienced as well. I've uh, been thinking about you guys, been praying for you. I'm so grateful uh, for your partnership in the gospel and uh, thankful for you guys coming alongside of us, not only financially, but knowing this past year that you guys have been praying for us, been thinking about us. I thank you uh, for the notes and the text and the emails that you've you've sent. Uh, we started back services uh, after the um, uh, the long break that we had. We started back services on June the 14th, and we've been going consistently ever since. Uh, COVID hit us pretty hard here, and so in our little town, uh, we had 27 deaths from COVID. In fact, the first death in Massachusetts was um, here in Winthrop, and so hit us pretty hard. Uh, had a number of people that were part of our church that have moved. Uh, because they've lost jobs and things like that, and so uh, it's been a, it's been a strange year. We started back June, June the fourteenth, and um, you know before COVID hit, we were we were hitting seventy people every Sunday, which was incredible for us. And once we started back in June, uh, it was about thirty people. Uh, people. A lot of people here are still afraid. And, um, and I get that. And so we had about 30 people and we've continually, continuously met since then. And so we're running around 55 to 60 people each Sunday now. God's been so good to us. And, um, and we've just been able to see, even in the midst of all of that, we've seen people come to faith in Christ. We had a baptismal service on the beach and we got to baptize four more individuals. And so we've seen God just his incredible faithfulness to us. I was reading in a passage of scripture this morning, and uh, I thought about you whenever I was reading this. It's found in Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. Paul is speaking to the church there in Rome, and he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's my prayer for you guys and my prayers that God would fill you with all joy, with all peace, peace as you trust in him. And the result of that is that you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You guys stay safe, be blessed, and know that we love you. God bless you. So Jason Talent there at Harbor City Church in Winthrop, Massachusetts. We hope soon to be able to 
visit those hey, thanks again for joining us today to for worship. Don't forget that our online Bible studies have begun. You can catch those in a virtual in format as well. Just call our office and we can get you pray for signed that. up for God that. And that. next Sunday open evening, open we'll have Watoto here. Just two quick things before we go. Next Sunday night, we have Watoto Children's Choir virtually. We're going to do this in the gym. this past Thursday. Uh, did you have any left over? Nothing left over. So there's a, there's a follow-up ministry on Friday to take what's left over to Center of Hope, and there wasn't anything left over. So uh, incredible ministry. Thank you for what you do with that, you guys. And uh, we, we, pray, we, we just praise the Lord for that. Don't forget, uh, if you didn't get a ballot, you can pick up one outside, drop them in the offering plate as you go. God bless you. Thanks for being